Boring socks today, Bill, sorry, you're not going to like the socks. <laughs> Prime Minister, the President of the Premier Minister. Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank you, dear friends. It's wonderful to see you all today. Mr. President, it's an honour to welcome you to Parliament. On behalf of all Canadians, welcome to our House. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone here today to join in a moment of silence in memory of those killed and injured in yesterday's attack in Istanbul. Mr. President, the House we sit in today has witnessed many extraordinary moments in history. It's where governments made the difficult decision to send young men and women to war, decisions that forever changed our country and the world. It was here in 1922 that Agnes Macphail, our first female member of Parliament, showed generations of Canadian girls that, yes, they could. And now, finally, this House gets to see a bromance up close. <laughs> Thanks for making that possible. Although I still think dude diplomacy is more accurate, but I'll get over it. The truth is that while Barack and I are friends, it's a friendship that is far from unique. Que ce soit be it through family, friends, social media, 
or even by the $2.4 billion in goods and services that cross our border every day, the links between Canadians and Americans are everywhere. And it is through those relationships that we give life to what President Kennedy stated when he addressed this House. What unites us is far greater than what divides us. Canadians and Americans are united in their quest for peace and prosperity. We all want real opportunities for success. And we understand that economic growth means most when it improves the lives of the people who work so hard to secure it, especially the middle class and those working hard to join it. And we echo the values of President Roosevelt, who said that the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have so much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Canadians and Americans are also united in our desire to leave to our children and grandchildren a better world, a safer, cleaner world than the one we inherited from our parents. That's an ambitious goal, but not one beyond our reach. Today, we made an important down payment on that cleaner future with a new continental climate change strategy. And finally, and at this moment, critically, Canadians and Americans are united in our understanding that diversity is a source of strength, not weakness. Generation after generation, our countries have welcomed newcomers seeking liberty and the promise of a better life. And generation after generation, our identities and our economies have been enriched by these new perspectives, not threatened by them. The North American idea that diversity is strength is our great gift to the world. No matter where you are from, or the faith you profess, nor the color of your skin, nor whom you love, you belong here. This is home. So let us reaffirm today with our American cousins the spirit that 153 years ago Abraham Lincoln called the last best hope on earth. Openness, diversity, inclusion, responsible self-government, freedom for all people. These ideas are as important today as they have ever been, and we will promote them together. On all these things, on economic opportunity, on the environment, on building a more inclusive and diverse society, Canadians and Americans agree. When people say that the President and I share a special relationship, there's something that they often don't realize. We are not inspired by each other, but by the people whom we have the privilege of serving from the mother who does overtime in order to pay her rent and buy new clothing for her daughter and save a little money to help her parents, from the retiree who gives his time to teach children the importance of protecting wetlands, communities that come together after a natural disaster or who walk side by side, hand in hand, to affirm the right These to love one another. These are the stories I will think of when I consider President Obama's time in office. History books will record the signature policies. What I will remember, what I hope we all 
will remember are the lessons you taught us, not by executive order, but by example. That we are accountable. lesson that we are accountable to each other, that we are stronger together than we are apart, that we are more alike than we are different, and that there is a place in this world for politics that is hopeful, hardworking, ambitious, and kind. Mr. President, in your last State of the Union address, you said of the American people that they are clear-eyed, big-hearted, undaunted by challenge, and optimistic. I can think of no better way to describe their leader. Barack, welcome to Canada. Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, Barack Obama. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, everyone, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. Bonjour. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, members of the House, members of the Senate, distinguished guests, people of Canada, thank you for this extraordinary welcome, which tempts me to just shut up and leave, uh, because they can't get any better than this. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the warm welcome. I am extraordinarily grateful for uh, the close working relationship and friendship uh, with your outstanding Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, and his extraordinary wife, uh, Sophie. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, much of this greeting is simply a reflection of the extraordinary alliance and deep friendship between Canadians and Americans. Justin, thank you for your very kind words uh, and for the new energy uh, and hope that your leadership uh, has brought uh, to your nation uh, as well as to the Alliance. Uh, my time in office may be nearing an end, but I know that Canada and the world will benefit from your leadership from years to come. So Canada was the very first country that I visited as president. It was in February. <laughs> it was colder. I was younger. Michelle now refers to my hair as the Great White North. And on that visit, I strolled around uh, the Byward Market, tried a beaver tail, which is better than it sounds. And I was struck then, as I am again today, by the warmth of Canadians. I could not be more honored to be joining you in this historic hall, this Cathedral of Freedom. And we Americans can never say it enough. We could not ask for a better friend or ally than Canada. We could not. It is true. 
and we do not take it for granted. That does not mean we don't have our differences. As I understand it, one of the reasons the Queen chose this site for Parliament was that it was a safe distance from America's border. <laughs> and I admit, in the War of 1812, American troops did some damage to Toronto. I suspect that there were some people up here who didn't mind when the British returned the favor and burned down the White House. <laughs> In more recent times, however, <laughs> the only forces crossing our borders are the armies of tourists and business people and families who are shopping and doing business and visiting loved ones. Our only battles take place inside the hockey rink. Even there, there is an uneasy peace that is maintained. As Americans, we, too, celebrate the life of Mr. Hockey himself the late, great Gordie Howe. Just as Canadians can salute American teams for winning more Stanley Cups in the NHL. I told you I should have stopped <laughs> after the applause. But in a world where too many borders are a source of conflict, our two countries are joined by the longest border of peace on Earth. And, and what makes our relationships so unique is not just proximity. It's our enduring commitment to a set of values, a spirit alluded to by Justin that says no matter who we are, where we come from, what our last names are, what faith we practice, here we can make of our lives what we will. There's the grit of pioneers and prospectors who pushed west across the forbidding frontier. The dreams of generations, immigrants, refugees, that were welcomed to these shores. The hope of runaway slaves who went north on an underground railroad. Deep in our history of struggle, said Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Canada was the North Star. The Freedom Road links us together. We're bound as well by the service of those who have defended us at Flanders Field, the beaches of Normandy, the skies of the Balkans, and more recently in the mountains of Afghanistan and training bases in Iraq. And their sacrifice is reflected in the silent rows of Arlington and in the Peace Tower above us. Today, we honor those who gave their lives uh, for all of us. We're linked together as well by the institutions that we've built to keep the peace. The United Nations to advance our collective aspirations. A NATO alliance to ensure our security. NORAD, where Americans and Canadians stand watch side by side. And track Senate on Christmas Eve. We're linked by a vast web of commerce that carries goods from one end of this continent to another. And we're linked by the ties of friendship and family. In my case, an outstanding brother-in-law from Burlington.
Had to give Burlington a shout out. Our, our relationship is so remarkable precisely because it seems so unremarkable, which is why Americans often are surprised when our favorite American actor or singer turns out to be Canadian. The point is, we see ourselves in each other, and our lives are richer for it. As President, I've deepened the ties between our countries. And because of the progress we've made in recent years, I can stand before you and say that the enduring partnership between Canada and the United States is as strong as it has ever been, and we are more closely aligned than ever before. And yet, we meet at a pivotal moment for our nations and for the globe. From this vibrant capital, we can look upon a world that has benefited enormously from the international order that we helped build together. But we can see that same order increasingly strained by the accelerating forces of change. The world is, by almost every measure, less violent than ever before. But it remains riven by old divisions and fresh hatreds. The world's more connected than ever before, but even as it spreads knowledge and the possibility of greater understanding between peoples, it also empowers terrorists who spread hatred and death, most recently in Orlando and Istanbul. The world is more prosperous than ever before. But alongside globalization and technological wonders, we also see a rise in inequality and wage stagnation across the advanced economies, leaving too many workers and communities fearful of diminishing prospects, not just for themselves, but more importantly for their children. And in the face of such rising uncertainty, it is not enough to look at aggregate growth rates or stock prices or the pace of digital innovation. If the benefits of globalization accrue only to those at the very top, if our democracies seem incapable of assuring broad-based growth and opportunity for everyone, then people will push back out of anger or out of fear. And politicians, some sincere and some entirely cynical will tap that anger and fear. Harkening back to bygone days of order and predictability and national glory, arguing that we must rebuild walls and disengage from a chaotic world, or rid ourselves of the supposed ills brought on by immigrants, all in order to regain control of our lives. We saw some of these currents at work this past week in the United Kingdom's referendum to leave the European Union. Despite some of the initial reactions, I am confident that the process can be managed in a prudent, orderly way. I expect that our friends on both sides of the channel will develop a workable plan for how to move forward. And I'm equally confident that the transatlantic values that we all share as liberal market-based democracies are deeper and stronger than any single event. But while the circumstances of Brexit may be unique to the United Kingdom, the frustrations people felt are not. The short-term fallout of Brexit can be sensibly managed, but the long-term trends of inequality and dislocation and the resulting social division those can't be ignored. How we respond to the forces of globalization and technological change will determine the durability of an international order that ensures security and prosperity for future generations. And fortunately, the partnership between the United States and Canada shows the path we need to travel. 
for our history and our work together speak to a common set of values to build on, proven values, values that your Prime Minister spoke of in his introduction, values of pluralism and tolerance, rule of law, openness, global engagement and commerce and cooperation, coupled with equal opportunity and an investment in our people at home. As Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau once said, a country, after all, is not something you build as the pharaohs build the pyramids and then leave standing there to defy eternity. A country is something that is built every day out of certain basic shared values. What is true of countries is true of the world. And that's what I want to talk about today, how to strengthen our institutions to advance these commitments in a rapidly changing world. Now, let me start with our shared economic vision. In all we do, our commitment to opportunity for all of our people has to be at the centerpiece of our work. We are so fortunate because both of our countries are so well positioned to succeed in the 21st century. Our two nations know firsthand the awesome power of free markets and innovation. Canadians help some, run some of Silicon Valley's most innovative companies. Our students study at each other's world-class universities. We invest in research and development and make decisions based on science and evidence. And it works. It's what's created these extraordinary economies of ours. But if the financial crisis and recent recession taught us anything, it's that economies do better when everyone has a chance to succeed. For a long time, it was thought that countries had to choose between economic growth or economic inclusion, but it turns out that's a false choice. If a CEO makes more in a day than a typical employee makes in a year, that kind of inequality is not just bad for morale in the company. It turns out it's bad for the economy. That worker is not a very good customer for business. <laughs> if, if a young man if a young man in Ohio can't pay his student loans or a young woman in Ontario can't pay her bills, that has ramifications for our economy. It, it tamps down the possibilities of growth. So we need growth that is broad and that lifts everybody up, including tax policies that do right by working families and robust safety nets for those who fall on hard times. As John Kenneth Galbraith once said, the common denominator of progress is our people. It's not numbers. It's not abstractions. It's how, how are people doing? Now, of course, many who share this progressive, inclusive vision can be heard now arguing that investments in our people, protections for our workers, fair tax policies, these things are not enough. For them, globalization is inherently rigged towards the top 1%. And therefore, what's needed is an end to trade agreements and various international institutions and arrangements that integrate national economies. And I understand that vision. I, I, I know why it's tempting. It, it seems as if, if we draw a line around our borders that it'll give us more control, particularly when the benefits of trade and economic integration are sometimes hard to see or easy to take for granted. And the very specific dislocations are obvious and real. There's just one problem. Restricting, uh, restricting trade or giving in to protectionism in this 21st century economy will not work. It will not work.
We, even if we wanted to, we can't seal ourselves off from the rest of the world. The day after Brexit, people looked around and said, oh, how's this going to work? The drag that economic weakness in Europe and China and other countries is having on our own economies right now speaks to the degree to which we depend, our economies depend, our jobs, our businesses depend on selling goods and services around the world. Very few of our domestic industries can sever what is now truly a global supply chain. And so, for those of us who truly believe that our economies have to work for everybody, the answer is not to try and pull back from our interconnected world. It is rather to engage with the rest of the world, to shape the rules so they're good for our workers and good for our businesses. And the experience between our two nations points the way. The United States and Canada have the largest bilateral trade and investment relationship in the world, and we are stronger for it. It means a company in Quebec — it means a company in Quebec can create jobs in North Carolina, and the startup in Toronto can attract investment from Texas. Now, the problem is that some economies in many of the fastest-growing regions of the world particularly the Asia-Pacific region, don't always abide by the same rules. They impose unfair tariffs, or they suppress workers' rights, or they maintain low environmental standards that make it hard for our businesses to compete fairly. And with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we have the ability to not only open up these markets to U.S. and Canadian products and eliminate thousands of these unfair tariffs, which, by the way, we need to do because they're already selling here under existing rules, but we're not selling as much as we should over there. But it also affords us the opportunity to increase protections for workers and the environment and promote human rights, including strong prohibitions against human trafficking and child labor. And that way, our workers are competing on a level playing field. And our businesses are less prone to pursue a race to the bottom. And when combined with increased investments in our own people's education and skills and training and infrastructure and research and development and connectivity, then we can spur the kind of sustained growth that makes all of us better off. All of us. The point is, we need to look forward, not look backward. And more trade and more people-to-people -people ties can also help break down old divides. I thank Canada for its indispensable role in hosting our negotiations with the Cuban government and supporting our efforts to set aside half a century of failed policies to begin a new chapter with the Cuban people. I know a lot of Canadians like going to Cuba, <laughs> maybe because they haven't had Americans crowd in the streets and the beaches, but that's changing. <laughs> and as more Americans engage with the Cuban people, it'll mean more economic opportunity and more hope for ordinary Cubans. We also agree, us Americans and Canadians, that wealthy countries like ours cannot reach our full potential, while others remain mired in poverty. That, too, is not going to change in this interconnected world. That if there's poverty and disease and conflict in other parts of the world, it spills over as much as we'd like to pretend that we can block it out. So with our commitment to new sustainable development goals, we have the chance to end the outrage of extreme poverty.
We can bring more. We can bring more electricity to Africa so that students can study at night and businesses can stay open. We can banish the scourge of malaria and Zika. We can realize our goal of the first AIDS-free generation. We can do that. It's within our grasp. And we can help those who are working to replace corruption with transparent, accountable institutions that serve their people. As leaders in global development, the United States and Canada understands that development is not charity. It's an investment in our future prosperity. Because not only do such investments and policies help poor countries, they're going to create billions of customers for U.S. and Canadian products. And they'll make less likely the spread of deadly epidemics to our shores. And they'll stabilize parts of the world that threaten the security of our people. In fact, both the United States and Canada believe our own security, and not just prosperity, is enhanced when we stand up for the rights of all nations and peoples to live in security and peace. And even as there are times when unilateral action is necessary to defend our people, we believe that in a world where wars between great powers are far less likely, but transnational threats like terrorism know no boundaries, our security is best advanced when nations work together. We believe that disputes that do arise between nations should be, wherever possible, resolved peacefully with diplomacy, that international organizations should be supported, that multilateralism is not a dirty word. And certainly, And certainly, we're more secure when we stand united against terrorist networks and ideologies that have reached to the very doorstep of this hall. We honor all those taken from us by violent extremists, including Canadians John Ridsdale and Robert Hall. With Canada's additional contributions, including training Iraqi forces, our coalition is on the offensive across Iraq, across Syria, and we will destroy the terrorist group ISIL. We will destroy them. We'll continue helping local forces and in sharing intelligence from Afghanistan to the Philippines so that we're pushing back comprehensively against terrorist networks. And in contrast to the hatred and the nihilism of terrorists, we'll work with partners around the world, including particularly Muslim communities, to offer a better vision and a path of development and opportunity and tolerance because they are and must be our partners in this effort. <laughs> Meanwhile, when nations violate international rules and norms, such as Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the United States and Canada stand united, along with our allies, in defense of our collective security. And doing so requires a range of tools, like economic sanctions, 
but it also requires that we keep our forces ready for 21st century missions and invest in new capabilities. And as your ally and as your friend, let me say that we'll be more secure when every NATO member, including Canada, contributes its full share to our common security. Because, The Canadian Armed Forces are really good. And if I can borrow a phrase, the world needs more Canada. NATO needs more Canada. We need you. We need you. Now, just as we join together in our common defense, so must we work together diplomatically, particularly to avert war. And diplomacy results are rarely quick. But it turns out even the most intractable conflicts can be resolved. Here in our own hemisphere, just in the last few weeks, after half a century of war, Colombia is poised to achieve a historic peace. And the nations of North America, the nations of North America will be an important partner to Colombia going forward, including working to remove landmines. Around the world, Canadian and American diplomats working together can make a difference. Even in Syria, where the agony and the suffering of the Syrian people tears at our hearts. Our two nations continue to be leaders in humanitarian aid to the Syrian people, and although a true resolution of this conflict so far has eluded us, we know that the only solution to this civil war is a political solution so that the Syrian people can reclaim their country and live in peace, and Canadians and Americans are going to work as hard as we can to make that happen. I should add that here in the nation of Lester Pearson, we reaffirm our commitment to keep strengthening the peacekeeping that saves lives around the world. There is one threat, however, that we cannot solve militarily, nor can we solve alone, and that's the threat of climate change. Now, climate change is no longer an abstraction. It's not an issue we can put off for the future. It is happening now. It is happening here, in our own countries. The United States and Canada are both Arctic nations, and last year when I became the first U.S. President to visit the Arctic, I could see the effects myself. Glaciers, like Canada's Athabasca Glacier, are melting at alarming rates. Tundra is burning, permafrost is thawing. This is not a conspiracy. It's happening. Within a generation, Arctic sea ice may all but disappear in the summer. And so skeptics and cynics can insist on denying what's right in front of our eyes. But the Alaska natives that I met, whose ancestral villages are sliding into the sea, they don't have that luxury. They know climate change is real. They know it is not a hoax. And from Bangladesh to the Pacific Islands, rising seas are swallowing land and forcing people from their homes. Around the world, stronger storms and more intense droughts will create humanitarian crises and risk more conflict. This is not just a moral issue, not just an economic issue. It is also an urgent matter of our national security. And for too long, we've heard that confronting climate change means destroying our own economies. But let me just say, carbon emissions in the United States are back to where they were two decades ago, even as we've grown our economy dramatically over the same period. Alberta, the oil country of Canada, is working hard to reduce emissions while still promoting growth. So if Canada can do it and the United States can do it, the whole world 
can unleash economic growth and protect our planet. We can do this. We can do it. We can do this. We can help lead the world to meet this threat. Already, together in Paris, we achieved the most ambitious agreement in history to fight climate change. Now let's bring it into force this year. With our, with our agreement with Mexico that we announced today, let's generate half the electricity on this continent from clean energy sources within a decade. That's achievable. Let's partner in the Arctic to help give its people the opportunity they deserve while conserving the only home they know. And building on the idea that began in Montreal three decades ago, let's finally phase down dangerous HFC greenhouse gases. This is the only planet we've got, and this may be the last shot we've got to save it. And America and Canada are going to need to lead the way. We're going to have to lead the way. Just as we're joined in our commitment to protecting the planet, we are also joined in our commitment to the dignity of every human being. We believe in the right of all people to participate in society. We believe in the right of all people to be treated equally, to have an equal shot at success. That is in our DNA, the basic premise of our democracies. I think we can all agree that our democracies are far from perfect. They can be messy, and they can be slow, and they can leave all sides of a debate unsatisfied. Justin's just getting started. So in case you hadn't figured that out, that's where this gray hair comes from. But more than any other system of government, democracy allows our most precious rights to find their fullest expression enabling us, through the hard, painstaking work of citizenship, to continually make our countries better, to solve new challenges, to right past wrongs. And Prime Minister, what a powerful message of reconciliation it was here and around the world when your government pledged a new relationship with Canada's First Nations. Democracy is not easy. It's hard. Living up to our ideals can be difficult even in the best of times, and it can be harder when the future seems uncertain or when, in response to legitimate fears and frustrations, there are those who offer a politics of us versus them, a politics that scapegoats others, the immigrant, the refugee someone who seems different than us. We have to call this mentality what it is, a threat to the values that we profess, the values we seek to defend. It's because we respect all people that the world looks to us as an example. The colors of the rainbow flag have flown on Parliament Hill. They have lit up the White House. That is a testament to our progress, but also the work that remains to ensure true equality for our fellow citizens who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Our Muslim friends and neighbors who run businesses and serve in our governments and in our armed forces and our friends with our children and play on our sports teams. We 
We've got to stand up against the slander and the hate leveled against those who look or worship differently. That's our obligation. That's who we are. That's what makes America special. That's what makes Canada special. Here, here in Canada, Here in Canada, a woman has already risen to the highest office in the land. In America, for the first time, a woman is the presumptive nominee of a major party and perhaps president. I have a bias on these issues, but, but our work won't be finished until all women in our country are truly equal, paid equally treated equally, given the same opportunities as men, when our girls have the same opportunities as our boys. That's who we need to be. And let me say this, because I don't feel particularly politically correct on this issue. I don't believe that these are American values or Canadian values or Western values. I believe, and Justin believes, and I hope all of you believe, these are universal values. And we must be bold in their defense at home and around the world and not shy away from speaking up on behalf of these values of pluralism and tolerance and equality. I fear sometimes that we are timid in defense of these, these values. That's why we'll continue to stand up for those inalienable rights here in our own hem hemisphere, in places like Cuba and Venezuela, but also in more distant lands. For the rights of citizens and civil society to speak their mind and work for change. For the rights of journalists to report the truth for the rights of people of all faiths to practice their religion freely. Those things are hard, but they're right. They're not always convenient, but they're true. In the end, it is this respect for the dignity of all people, especially the most vulnerable among us, that perhaps more than anything else binds our two countries together. Being Canadian, being American is not about what we look like or where our families came from. It is about our commitment to a common creed. And that's why together we must not waver in embracing our values, our best selves. And that includes our history as a nation of immigrants. And we must continue to welcome people from around the world. The vibrancy of our economies are enhanced by the addition of new striving immigrants. But this is not just a matter of economics. When refugees escape barrel bombs and torture, when migrants cross deserts and seas seeking a better life, we cannot simply look the other way. We certainly can't label as possible terrorists vulnerable people who are fleeing terrorism. We can insist that the process is orderly. We can in insist that our security is preserved. Borders mean something. But at moments like this, we are called upon to see ourselves in others because 
we were all once strangers. If you weren't a stranger, your grandparents were strangers. Your great-grandparents were strangers. They didn't all have their papers ready. They fumbled with language, faced discrimination, had cultural norms that didn't fit. At some point, somewhere, your family was an outsider. So the mothers, the fathers, the children we see today, they're us. And we can't forsake them. So as Americans and Canadians, we will continue to welcome refugees. And we can ensure that we're doing so in a way that maintains our security. We can and we will do both. We can and we will do both. We're increasing our support to Central America so that fewer families and children attempt the dangerous journey north. This fall, at the United Nations, we'll host a global summit on refugees, because in the face of this crisis, more nations need to step up and meet our basic obligations to our fellow human beings. And it will be difficult, and budgets are tight, and there are legitimate issues, and not everybody's going to be helped. But we can try. People of goodwill and compassion show us the way. Greek islanders pulling families to shore, and Germans handing out sweets to migrants at railway stations. A synagogue in Virginia inviting Syrian refugees to dinner. And here in Canada, the world has been inspired as Canadians across this country have opened up their hearts and their homes. And we've watched citizens knitting toques to keep refugees warm in the winter. <laughs> and we've seen your prime minister welcome new arrivals at the airport and extend the hand of friendship and say, you're safe at home now. And we see the refugees who feel that they have a special duty to give back and seize the opportunity of a new life. Like the girl who fled Afghanistan by donkey and camel and jet plane and who remembers being greeted in this country by helping hands and the sound of Robin singing. And today, she serves in this chamber and in the cabinet because Canada is her home. Country is not something you build as the pharaohs built the pyramids. A country is something that is built every day out of certain basic shared values. How true that is. How blessed we are to have had people before us day by day brick by brick, build these extraordinary countries of ours. How fortunate, how privileged we are to have the opportunity to now, ourselves, build this world anew. What a blessing. And as we go forward together on that freedom road, let's stay true to the values that make us who we are, Canadians and Americans, allies, and friends, now and forever. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.
Mr. President, and Prime Minister, Madame Grégoire Trudeau, Mr. Speaker of the House of Commons, Excellencies, Honorable Senators, Members of the House of Commons, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, it is a great honor for me to thank you for being here today, and I'd like to thank you for your address to our Parliament. I'd like to thank you for being here today and for addressing this joint session of our Parliament. The obvious enthusiasm which, which you have been received has already spoken far more eloquently than anything I might add about the admiration which we have for you. As our two countries both seek to advance the same principles that you have already mentioned, we share the same hopes and dreams, not only for ourselves, but for that of our brother nations as well. Because of this shared belief in upholding these principles, Canadians from across this great, great country have followed your presidency closely, and we have watched you face many challenges. But through it all, you have persisted with calm, with reason, and with an unwavering clarity of purpose. The result has been an extraordinary legacy for the American people and for the whole of the international community. The great American philosopher and war veteran, Philip Haley, when writing about the turmoil in the world, said that we are, each of us, living in the eye of a hurricane. The destructive and cruel power in the world of both nature and our fellow human beings is always nearby, swirling around us. But in the center, in the eye of the hurricane, there can be peace and calm, and our job, individually and collectively, is to do our best to push out the borders of the eye of that storm, to expand the calm, to expand the reasonable and the good that is and can be in the world we live in. Mr. President, in a world that has so often seemed riven by waves of anger and destruction, by unimaginable acts of violence and forces beyond our control, you have stood tall. You have stood tall for the power of reason over passion, and principle over politics. In your own words, you have cautioned us. In your very own words, from the audacity of hope, you have cautioned us that we will need to remind ourselves, despite all our differences, just how much we share. Common hopes, common dreams, and above all, a bond that will not be broken. In closing, Mr. President, on behalf of all of my parliamentary colleagues, and indeed on, on, on the behalf of all Canadians, I thank you for the very inspiring words you shared with us today, for your years of leadership in the world, and most especially for your very strong and enduring friendship with our great country, Canada. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. President, Prime Minister, Madame Gregor Tudeau, Mr. Speaker of the Senate, Excellencies, Honorable Senators, Members of the House of Commons, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Mr. President, on behalf of all of us here in the Chamber, I'd like to thank you for having addressed us today. It's really nice to have you back in Ottawa and to be able to receive you when the city's at its loveliest. The last time you dropped by, in February of 2009, the weather was decidedly cooler. 
So all of Ottawa still remembers that you braved the cold to stop in at a nearby bakery and pick up some maple leaf cookies for your daughters. <laughs> now, sir, you mentioned the few flecks of grey you have in your hair. Well, when a newly minted Prime Minister Trudeau visited you last fall in Washington, you very kindly tried to prepare him for the greying effect of leadership, telling him, if in fact you plan to keep your dark hair, you'll have to start, to start dyeing it early. <laughs> May I just say to you both, it could be worse. There is an inscription embedded in granite on the International Friendship Memorial that marks the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project, dedicated by Queen Elizabeth II and U.S. Vice President Nixon near Prescott, Ontario in 1959. It reads as follows. This stone bears witness to the common purpose of two nations whose frontiers are the frontiers of friendship, whose ways are the ways of freedom, and whose works are the works of peace. It would take much too long to count the ways in which Canada and the United States have come together to create a better life for their own people, but also for humanity. However, over the years, several of our respective leaders have commented on the close friendship between our two countries. Almost 40 years ago, former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau remarked in a speech to Congress, the friendship between our two countries is so basic, so non-negotiable, that it has long since been regarded as the standard for enlightened international relations. And when you last visited us in 2009, sir, you echoed those sentiments, saying, as neighbors, we are so closely linked that sometimes we may have the tendency to take our relationship for granted. But the very success of our friendship throughout history demands we renew and deepen our cooperation here in the 21st century. And as a good neighbor, here you are again doing just that. Mr. President, thank you for your visit, for your friendship, and for strengthening the enduring ties of family that bind our two nations together. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you very much, and have a safe trip home.